Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and today's show features the psychic medium Walter Zajac to talk about his novel, They Came Beyond Deja Vu. The Dare to Dream podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award and featured in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. I actually have an announcement. I have been nominated for a COVR award, which stands for the Coalition of Visionary Resources for this podcast. So they are voting right now. Hold a good thought for this podcast. And the show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do wonderful energy work out into the world. You can be a facilitator or take a class. It's Dr. Dane, H E E R dot com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a book writing coach and a visibility mentor. I show you three different hubs of visibility to get you where you want to go and to be seen and heard and known for your message. The first is that I coach you to write a highly engaging page turner book. The second is I take your book to a guaranteed international bestselling status and I do all the hefty, heavy, hefty lifting for the author. And the third piece is I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. If you're ready to be seen and heard in any of these venues and you'd like to get started right away, I've got a gift for you. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift and get your templates, get your videos of how to's. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And so this episode features a conversation with the empowerment psychic. My guest is Walter Zajac, who for 20 years has been hailed as one of the best psychics on the West Coast. As an acclaimed psychic medium, certified tarot reader, NLP coach, Reiki master, and love coach, he has empowered and guided thousands through enlightening psychic readings and inspiring coaching and healing sessions. Globally, his experience working in 12 different countries has given him keen insight into people's distinctions, commonalities, and cultures. Walter continues to receive dreams and psychic visions that come true. And having suffered so much as a child, he is especially intuitive about the pain and suffering that is hidden within others. To hear Walter Zajac narrate selected scenes from the paperback and audiobook of They Came Beyond Deja Vu, go to walterzajac.com. It's Walter Z A J A C dot com. And with that, I welcome Walter to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you here. Debbie, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. You're, I, I'm actually very honored because you have such heavy hitters on your show. Like Dr. Stephen Greer, just last week, I was very impressed. Thank you. And you're a heavy hitter too. You really Thank are. You. <laughs> Thank this you. This book you wrote that was so meaningful to read. I just want to start with, was it healing for you to write? Big time, because in order to write it, I had to remember, and, well, of course, that's what we all do, but I was sent to an orphanage at six years old, not knowing that I was going to an orphanage and thinking I was going on a fun train ride, which ended at an orphanage. And um, what was therapeutic was, first of all, I realized as I started to write the book that I hung on to a lot of memories and mm -hmm. um, my half brother, half sister, <clears throat> when I met them many years later, I was reunited with them. They were amazed at the detail of my memory, right? So absolutely, it was therapeutic because it was pretty much like reliving it, which then also was difficult because there were a lot of times where I bawled my little eyes out. <laughs> oh, but you did. And I wonder if the being you are now and the child you were then is receiving even more healing from readers like myself, because I just, I wanted so much to read through the pages and just hug 
this child so many times. Um, the idea that you were sent somewhere and nobody told you and explained so much of your life. I'm amazed at who you are today. Even when you eventually were adopted and these words, you didn't even know what they were, what was going on. So confusing for a child. Yeah. So I do wonder how much people like me who are just emitting all this love and care and empathy while reading your book, if somehow it is reaching child Walter somewhere, helping him. Uh, I like that. That hasn't occurred to me, but yeah, it feels right. It feels like that absolutely happens that, that I get that sense of energy, just uh, empathy, I guess is um, a good way to put it. But uh, to me, it's connection. It's that sense of I, I'm really realizing through these many years of life that we're all interconnected and even quantum physics says so now that energetically we're all in, in, interconnected and then spiritually, absolutely, we're all in this together. There is a mass consciousness. There really is. It's something that Carl Jung talked about many years ago. Mm. <clears throat> Will you tell the people who are listening and watching a little bit, a brief synopsis, if you will, about your journey? And uh, in the book, they came deja vu. The lead character's name is Wolfgang or Wolfie, but it's actually you, Walter, right? Yeah, every scene in the book happened to me. I changed names of people and places in order to protect people's privacy because um, some people just didn't want their privacy invaded and some people were not too nice. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's uh, the book starts in uh, war torn Germany, which is something that we're seeing scenes of now in war torn Ukraine. Um, the uh, according to Exeter University in the UK, they did a study a, a while back, 36 cities in Germany were completely leveled by American and British bombers. Sorry, not completely, anywhere from 80 to 95 percent completely leveled by American Brit and British bombers towards the end of World War II because the Nazis were hiding tank factories, munitions factories, and you name it military stuff among the population and the Americans and British really had no other choice in order to bomb those facilities. They had to bomb everything. They did what's called carpet bombing, which is just like mowing a lawn, strips of bombs coming out row after row. And uh, so my city was about 95% leveled during the war. The population went from 236,000 at the beginning of the war to 50,000 in 1945, that was six years. Six That's years, and sadly, the same crap is happening in Ukraine, just, just because somebody feels like invading a country, which is what Hitler did. Um, and then the people pay for it. Um, so my city, uh, see, I was, it was 56 when the, the, the book starts, and that was 11 years after the war ended, and my city was still about 50% um, debris, just bombed out shells of buildings and piles of rubble. And you, you take the bus downtown and there would be block after block of just destruction. And um, men without arms, without legs. My father had a friend who uh, had no legs and got around on a four-wheel four, four cart next to the ground like, um, Eddie Murphy in trading places, right? But Eddie Murphy was faking it. This guy had no legs. And I saw that kind of stuff as a regular occurrence. And then of course we, we hated the Amis, the Americans because of what they did to our city. And, and because holy smokes, they scared the crap out of us because of what they did to our city. And um, I was told I was going on an exciting train ride and I had an older, brother, half brother, half sister, 10 years older, six years older than me. And they always got to do all kinds of stuff I never got to do. And I got to go on a train ride. I was excited. <clears throat> Red Cross lady took me on a two hour train ride and I was expecting I was going to be home that night. And uh, then after a short walk through the country, I arrived at a place called Orphanage. And that was a word I had never heard before. And they told me that now your mom is really, really sick. You won't ever be going home again. 
And um, then they allowed my father to come a few weeks later to visit me. He was uh, not married to my mother and he was a severe alcoholic wife beater. Just whew, a really super angry person. And uh, my mother was not about to leave me to him. They allowed him to come visit once and, and, and that's when I found out that my mama had died. But as a five, five, six years old, I was just before my sixth birthday. I didn't, just none of this made sense. It just didn't make any sense. I didn't know where to put it. And my first impulse was, and then for decades later, was, was that life was messing with me. The universe was messing with me. God, messing with me. Right? So uh, I lived my life as a victim. And then uh, after a year at the orphanage, I was adopted by an American Air Force couple, the Amis, at least in German, we call them the Scheiß Amis, which means the shitty Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and they were that, right? And then they were also super angry people. Within three weeks of arriving at their house, I was being spanked so hard that my, my bare bottom was bleeding. And, you know, there were good things about that, but it was abusive. And so, again, I was just beat down, beat down. But what was beautiful, and it's something that I've used to, to forgive, and that is being grateful for what my adopted father did do for me. And that was, he was an amateur musician, and he bought me instruments and encouraged me to play. And I ended up going into the Air Force Band, and I ended up having a, a number 18 billboard pop chart hit in, in Europe and ended up playing in, in audiences of thousands regularly and was completely fulfilled. I buried myself in my music and whenever I was behind a drum set, I was confident, I was good and I had a good time. But if I was in a social setting, even just with a girl, I was a mess because I saw myself as, as a victim. And um, after a music career that lasted uh, 28 years total, um, I ended up, like many of us do, you had it happen too, in a day job. <laughs> a day job, which, you know, for us artists, that's like the ultimate sacrifice, a day job, right? <laughs> um, and um, during the, my time in the orphanage, I had two imaginary friends, I'm leading up to the day job thing, two imaginary friends who, with whom I interacted on a regular basis, like frequently every day. And with each of them, I knew vivid details of a particular traumatic event that they had gone through. One of them was the, the accident girl, I call her Maria is her name in the book. I saw uh, the vivid details over and over and over of her getting into a truck, having a hor horrifying accident, being disfigured and, and having her head crushed in and at the hospital, having a near death experience and having the bandages come off. I saw all of that over and over and over. And I interacted with her. And then this other one, like if I, you know, was going for a walk at the orphanage, she's laying in the meadow looking at the clouds and suddenly she was there and we were playing and we would fly off to a cloud together. And, you know, at five, six years old, that stuff is real to you, right? And many people say that, well, yeah, you're actually doing that. It's not just pretending you're actually doing it on some level. And so they became my companions and orphanage you know too many kids competing for the attention of very few adults so there were no companions really and if you if you did they got adopted you know if you got close to somebody they would get adopted and you never saw them again so um by the way do you know what ever happened to frank the bully <laughs> no i don't lord and, i wonder if yeah. he ever made it like even alive because he was he Succeedingly angry, and in the end, oh, yeah. to be angry because of also again because of what American bombs did, right? <laughs> right. Well, also being in an orph I mean, who knows where he came from, and being in an orphanage, and uh, and the people who ran the orphanage, you know, the yeah. way they ran it, and I, I, 
you know, at the same time you have compassion. It's like, he's, he's not, he's a terrible kid, right? And he did terrible things to you. And at the same time, you sort of get it. But yeah, I really wondered, is he even going to make it past his teenage years? He's such a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, I hated him for all of my life. <laughs> In his name, I didn't change because <laughs> I was still so angry. Let's not change his name. Let's keep, let him be Frank still. <laughs> um, so imaginary friends, right, which then um, were daily and that went on for many years. Plus, um, I was being chased over and over in, in repetitive dreams by a man in black, which was a nightmare and which would just scared the crap out of me every time that it happened. And that was also happening all of my life. That just made no sense. But then when I was 44 doing this day job, I met the accident girl in real life. She became a real person in my life. And I felt a connection. It was a phone relationship. I had actually been speaking to her for a few years. She was a receptionist at a company that I called regularly on my day job. And she had this magical, beautiful voice. Right, one moment, please, I'll connect to you. Right? <laughs> and, oh, yeah, but we never talked beyond that. And uh, one day I made her laugh. And uh, to, to laugh to the point where she couldn't stop laughing. She had to put herself on, on, on mute because she was laughing so hard. And, you know, when you laugh with somebody, you connect spiritually. You just feel each other's souls. And in that moment, we just, oh, my God, I feel like I know you. She felt that. I felt that. I didn't recognize her as the accident girl. But from that moment, we started talking personally. After a few weeks, she said, I have a confession to make. A few years ago, I was in a really horrible accident and my face got crushed in and, and, and disfigured and, and other stuff. And I've had 17 surgeries. And then she told me the, about the accident, started telling me the story, and I finished the story for her. I finished the story in detail finished the story. And then over the course of the next couple of weeks, I told her five things that she had never told another human. Five things, like she was floating above her body in the top of the truck cab, um, that she had a near-death experience and went to the other side. I went with her, that she was floating above her body in the surgery and looked over at me and said, who's the girl? Which was her body that when her bandages came off, she screamed at her mother, why did you let me live? Because she looked so ugly. Mm. She'd never told those things to another human. Mm. And that of course freaked her out that I knew that. And how did I know it? Because I had been seeing it over and over and over. And it was beautiful for a little while. Connection is like, wow, how amazingly magical, right? But then relatively quickly, especially after I told her stuff she had never told another human, then it started being creepy to her. Oh. Who is this guy? Who is this guy who knows stuff about me? You know, and it was before the internet, so I couldn't have found stuff out that way. And she had never told people these things anyway. It just became exceedingly creepy and 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 she felt emotionally violated by my knowledge by my presence and then how the hell do you explain this guy and who he is to your parents your friends so she severed the relationship and it crushed me it crushed me because this was a connection the only connection i had to who little walter was who little, what happened to little Walter and, and the stuff he went through and this was my companion and I, oh my God, I loved her. And then of course, yeah, I loved her when I met her in real life. Um, and this was uh, mostly phone. I saw her one time in person uh, in the hospital after another surgery. But when she cut it off, it was as almost as devastating as arriving at the orphanage. Speechless, right? And what was beautiful about it, though, was that was the very thing that made me realize, dude, you need some help. And friends, good friends, had been telling me for years, dude, you need some help. <laughs> 
just, you know, knowing what I had been through that, if, yeah, of course you need some help figuring that stuff out. Right. But I had always said, no, I got this. I got this right. Refusing because I didn't want to relive it. Crap. I don't want to relive that. Well, you oh. know, that was what I, I'm so glad you're broaching this because that was a question I had. So on this side of your life, I mean, you're the guy who puts out these amazing memes, you know, we're friends on Facebook and Instagram. You have the most amazing, upbeat, Thank you. inspiring memes and Thank you know, you. everything about you is positivity and motivation. And I know one of the things you like to say is gratitude is the antidote. Yeah. So how <laughs> did you get from the trauma? And, you know, there are people have to read the book. And by the way, folks, it's not like a downer. I got to say, it's like, it's a, a compelling read. It's amazing. Thank you. And, yeah. yeah. It's And well-deserved. So here you have this like crazy life and you've been <laughs> through so much. How did you get from the trauma of what you experienced to this healthy being you are now? What was that healing journey that you took to become who you are? That was the help that I realized I needed. I found a psychologist. And, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I highly recommend a psychologist as opposed to psychiatrist, because a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who prescribes drugs. A psychologist can't prescribe drugs. All they have is to heal the problem, find out what's wrong and help you heal the problem, not cover it up with drugs. So I found a psychologist who is the daughter of a Toltec shaman, which was, holy smokes, really? Are you kidding? And I had read the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. Don Juan was a, a Toltec shaman, Don Juan Matas, and Carlos Castaneda became a Toltec shaman. He went through an apprenticeship. And uh, people probably know Don Miguel Ruiz. He's a Toltec shaman. And this Toltec, Toltec shamanic tradition is in Central and South America. It goes back thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years or more. It's incredibly incredible ancient wisdom, but what do shamans, I don't know the plural of that word, sh shamans and shamans, <laughs> what do they do? They go to other realities, they go to other worlds. And Venita, my psychologist, had experienced this with her shaman father. She had gone to other realities, to other worlds. And when I told her my story, her reaction was, that's nothing compared to what I've been through. You're not crazy, you're psychic. And that's how you took care of yourself. You found these two entities in the psychic world who would later appear as real women in your life and cause you to finally realize, oh my God, I need some help. <laughs> That's, yeah, that, it was okay. That's it was my nice. survival mechanism, and uh, both of these girls were uh, were not born until fifteen years after my psychic experiences. Okay. So I was tuning into their futures, yes, and playing with them in the spirit world, and and that's one of the things that has made me realize that yeah, that probably is reincarnation because you know we go there and we come here. And, Right. And time is an illusion and parallel universes and yeah. life. Yes. All of that. Yeah. And so but this Toltec shaman is guiding you when you need counsel. She wasn't a shaman. She was the daughter of, right? She's a ah. psychologist. So it wasn't a lineage being passed down. She Correct. She was not a shaman, even though she had those experiences with him. She didn't use it in her work. Mm. She was a, has a master's degree in psychology. And she taught me the first thing she taught me was now be here now because mm. the moment I arrived in the orphanage now sucked didn't want to be here now so I lived other places I lived in the fantasy world with Mar Maria and the other one I lived in the future of us oh, I'm gonna have this finally someday right or somebody's actually gonna love me someday and I lived in a world where I was making stuff up, living in fantasy, or I was constantly looking over my shoulder, worried about what was going to happen. And none of that allowed me to be here now. Right? So that was the first thing she brought to me. And I, to me, that was a foreign concept. What? <laughs> and then the other thing she brought me was loving Walter. And the thing that was the magic about it was, you know, we're all taught 
uh, told to do that by various advisors and self-help books. You got to love yourself before you can get anything else. And to me, that was, and to a lot of my clients, boy, is that hard. How the hell do you do that? Right. And she wanted me, the psychologist, Vanita, wanted me to look in the mirror every day and look Walter in the eyes and say, I love you, Walter. I couldn't do that. Okay. I didn't, didn't love him. And I was too busy being all these other places, wasn't here now. But she took me on an, uh, through a journey. It's something that I do with clients now where she put little Walter on my lap, had me hold him and feel him and smell him and feel his little heart beating against my chest as his back was to me and put my cheek on the top of his head and feel his hair and smell his hair and say, I love you, Walter. I love you, Walter. And I fought her on that for four or five weeks. I don't want to do that. There's no way, no way, right? And she finally convinced, convinced me to do it. And the moment I was able to get those words out, I burst into tears because I felt him. Let's see, it's hitting me now. But that's what I've realized in my work too. When we're five years old, six years old and younger, we're the wisest we will ever be mm. because we're still precious, we're innocent, sweet, and we are still in tune with the psychic world where we came from. So we have wisdom and we have abilities, we have insight, and we want nothing more than just to be loved. Yeah. And when I felt that, when I felt, that, oh my God, that's little Walty, that's little Walty, right? And I loved him. Mm -hmm. And so then, I finally realized, well, if I look in the mirror and in, into my eyes and I see little Walter's eyes in the mirror, then I love him. That was the key. That was the key because there's nothing wrong with him. He's beautiful. He's precious. He's sweet. He's innocent and wants just to be loved. And I know him better than anybody else. And how did you get, so you're exposed as a child to pornography. Yeah, I was. And and two women were sexual with me regularly would crawl into bed with me naked and play with me yeah which is sexual abuse of a, of a child yeah how did you get to the other side of all of that therapy <laughs> um you know that Lots of us are abused sexually as kids, you know, of course, having gone through it and, and included it in my book, I did research too, and it's almost never reported, you know, compared to other crimes, only 20 to 25% of any sexual abuse cri crimes get reported, but of the ones that are reported to the Justice Department, the, the statistics that, are, that they keep, 80% are the parent. 80% are the parent who's sexually abusing the child and, the, and then six more percent are a loved one like an aunt or a close friend. Yeah. Right, and that was and, case. Yeah. So it's rampant and that's why it was important to me to write about it besides the fact that it happened to me, but it, it, gosh, I, I estimate about 70% of my clients it has happened to. And what it did to me you know, everybody's experience is different, but it's a, an incredibly twisted experience because these are people who love you. These are people that you love and they're getting sexual with you and there is pleasure in sexual touch. And so you're experiencing love and pleasure, but then you realize real quickly you can't tell anybody about it because first of all, they won't believe it. And second of all, they'll blame you. What are you doing? What did you do wrong? And then in my case, I enjoyed it. I liked it, you know, for a little boy that's being sexually abused by a man, there's very little enjoyment there because it's incredibly violating. In my case, it was touch and, and, and love. Um, but then I was sent to an orphanage and I made the connection that I was being punished for liking it. So for decades, every sexual thought that I had, if I tried to have sex, I would feel guilty, 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 guilty. So I was, yeah, crippled sexually. You know, I, I always wonder about that too, because what's fascinating is 
like you said, there's a part of you that knows something's off here, but there's a part of you, this human sexual part of you that's saying, I'm enjoying this. And it's equated with love at the same time. And it's so curious when you come into adulthood and you're wanting to experience a quote unquote normal sexual experience or intimacy with someone you're having a relationship with, how do you supersede a lot of those, you know, mixed and cross wires that you had going on? I didn't until, um, yeah, it was about the time that, that I started my therapy. I heard about tantric sex <gasps> and bought a video and watched it over and over and over. And in this video, people are actually having tantric sex and being interviewed and Tantric anything, as I understand it, is enjoying something to the fullest, you know, whether it's eating sex or, or an activity, enjoying it to the fullest and prolonging it. And so for a man to train himself in tantric sex, those are the two things to really allow yourself to enjoy it, right, which was super hard for me to allow myself to receive pleasure because I felt guilty and to prolong my ability to last, right, which is getting <laughs> personal, right? But in order to accomplish that, you have to be thinking sex and sex and sex and sex, right? And to just draw it in and to watch how these other people are doing it. And that's how I healed myself, just studying tantric sex and allowing myself to gradually step by step to receive pleasure. That is so cool. What an unexpected answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because I'm actually kind of, um, let's just call it really fascinated with Tantra. And I just last week featured two people, husband and wife, who do for decades. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Done uh, Tantra. And I'm, yeah, very into it, fascinated by it, and want to explore it more. So that yeah. is incredible well, that it could create that kind of. And let me just say quickly that. As far as sexuality and Tantra, it's about bringing spirit into it, right? Um, now I can't think of it, the, the famous book of positions, the Kama Sutra. Kama Sutra, yeah. Right? About 150 different positions, which is, oh, cool, positions, right? But if you look closely, you realize that in almost every single position, they're making eye contact. Mm. And what do we do when we have eye contact? We connect souls. Right, we see the universe and feel the universe through each other, and bringing that into sexuality, whew, it really increases the level of enjoyment in sex, mm. you know. And since allowing myself to enjoy was the problem, that's that's what really changed everything for me. I think most humans can relate to what you're saying because receiving is one of the most foregone qualities, right? Yeah. It's the yeah. most important really, to just receive. Um, and, and so all of this, you, you said, okay, we're on earth to overcome challenges. So explain that to me. Um, how does that explain life to us? And is there more why we're here on earth? Yeah, my understanding <clears throat> um, from talking to dead people, as we say here in Hollywood, right? <laughs> I talk to dead people. <laughs> um, talking to people on the other side is one of the things that a psychic medium does, right? And um, I observed this from James von Prague, who had a TV show for a while where he did psychic readings. And when James did it, he would prove to the client that this is really Uncle Bob by telling the client, so asking Uncle Bob for things that connect them, right? Her favorites, his favorites, least favorites, or moments that they spend together where they really connected hearts. So once I did started to do this professionally, I decided I need to do that because any message I get, if I haven't proved to Susan that it's Uncle Bob, the message is meaningless, right? So I ask Uncle Bob for three things that connect the two of them. And then we know when I get those three things, then usually Susan cries, says, <gasps> That's him, right? Because then we feel it. That, oh my God, Uncle Bob really is here, right? And then the message personally is, is usually something along the lines of, forgive me, right? For the things that I did and or forgiving Susan 
um, for the fact that Susan was too damn busy and didn't spend any time um, when Uncle Bob was dying, right? Those kinds of things. But then besides that, the main thing I hear consistently from every single person on the other side is, I didn't love enough. I didn't say it enough. I didn't spend enough time with the people I love. I didn't allow myself to be loved enough and I didn't have enough fun. And I can't do any of those things now because, and they're still trying, you know, like the Uncle Bob's. God, are they grateful to me because nobody's been listening, right? The Uncle Bob's is still trying to get a message of, oh my God, do this, have fun, love, love, love. Don't spend time at the office. Go love somebody, right? Go have good, have a good time and tell your sister such and such, right? They're always trying to communicate, but nobody's listening because generally we don't want to see a spirit in the room or hear voices, right? So we block that out. But that's the message of, I oh, can't do it now. Can't do it now. You have to do it while you're here. Life is short, life is short. And that's another thing that's consistent no matter how old they were when they died, whether they were 95 or nine, that was my time. It was my time. And even the ones who were 95, life was too short. Life was too short. And then the other thing comes from reading books about near-death experiences written by researchers like Dr. Raymond Moody, um, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who were two of the originals who studied near studied near death experiences, and um, books by Daniel Brinkley. Yeah. Okay, you know him. Maybe you've had him on your show too. Yeah, I have. And Daniel Brinkley, if people don't know, he has died and come back to life three different times. Spent a total of two hours on the other side, and the second time he decided, oh. I better pay attention because he realized where he was. And then the third time he paid detailed attention. And one of the things that he points out is that we're on life to experience, uh, in physical life, to experience the opposite of who we truly are. Who we truly are is just like the creator, just like God. We're all beauty, all, all happiness, all love. We're all powerful. Anything that you want, we have that capacity at least. And when we're in the spirit world, we are that. But how do we know what it is to be all beautiful unless we have it, something to compare it to? Huh, right. And that's why we manifest in physical life to experience ugliness in order to understand our true beauty. We come here to, under, to experience hate in order to understand the true deep meaning of love, etc. So that's a part of it. And then the other thing is, Look at our lives over and over and over. Do you know anybody who's had it easy? I don't, haven't met that person yet. And even the ones who were born rich, they're not having it easy necessarily on an emotional level. They're going through trauma and challenges, challenge after challenge. And what Daniel Brinkley talks about that really resonates with me is when we overcome a challenge, we're the happiest we'll ever be. We feel so good about ourselves. We feel so strong and we love everybody. But then we get bored, we get bored. And usually subconsciously, sometimes consciously, we decide on another challenge. Mm. And then we overcome it step by step. And that's how we grow and we learn. And then when we overcome that challenge, we're the happiest we'll ever be and we love everybody. And Daniel Brinkley says, not only are we uplifting ourselves each time we overcome a challenge, we're uplifting the entirety of creation. We're uplifting the mass consciousness because we all are interconnected. And when we have a better, deeper understanding, somehow it gets implied or put out into the mass consciousness and it helps everybody else understand more. It's interesting. Speaking of uh, challenges, so years ago, James Van Prog was on this show and he's just delightful, right? He's just such a cool, Sweet man. Yeah. yes, amazing human. And when we were done, uh, he was on Hay House Radio at the time. And he said, you know, I'd really like you to come on my show and I'd like to interview cool. you. It's like, no, I will say yes to that. <laughs> so I did go on his show and I was interviewed. But what I didn't realize is at the, towards the end of his show, like the last 30 minutes, he takes calls. And my God, he's got so many, he can't even from all over the world, everyone's calling him for a psychic reading. So there yeah. I am. Thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have time off here. Do your thing, James. And James said, Debbie, you're gonna be taking some of the calls. And I'm like, oh, wow. 
oh my God. <laughs> like, I don't know what he was thinking. I can uh, tell you I'm clairsentient. I can tell you I'm clear cognizant, but to do what perhaps you do this too as a psychic medium, certainly he does. I mean, he just like was answering people left and right with these details. And I had to, I had to let go. I had to literally surrender and say, you know, come through me, whatever is supposed to be for this person. Because if I shut down, you know, obviously it's going to be terrible. So I just <laughs> yeah. information, but that was like an immediate challenge when I heard him say that we're live on air, people calling from around the world for psychic readings from me and James, Lord. Um, <laughs> what an experience. Yeah. And so did you uh, give people some helpful insight? Seems like you did. Yeah, I was very proud of myself. It was That's the second awesome. time I'd been thrown into a situation like that as a psychic. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I just learned to rise to the occasion. And Beautiful. Yeah, people will receive what they needed to receive. And I prayed a lot, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, that's my beautiful. mouth easier. Yeah, that's so cool. And he put you on that hot spot because he knew you could do it. He felt it, I'm sure, right? Yeah, that was really trusting his, his yeah. show to me. But yeah, I mean, it was also, in a way, these challenges, that was a very positive challenge. It's really good. I mean, it's really good because if somebody had asked me, I would have said, I can't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't have the chance. It just yeah. it presented. And look, I came from showbiz, right? I saw <laughs> this my whole yeah. life. And you know, you smile and say yes. Yeah. Can I, can I, do I twirl a baton and, you know, can I flip upside down? Can I ride a horse? You bet I can. Like, whatever. Yeah. The show plus, goes on. plus, as an actress, you have to think on your feet and go with the moment and go with what you feel, right? That's fantastic. Yes. Right so interesting you would bring that up. Cool. So you, I want to talk a little bit about what you offer people. So now, not only have you healed your being so much to become someone who functions as an inspiration, but you're also, you give these readings, you give these counselings. Talk a little bit about what you offer around love and relationships. And I'd also like to know, Walter, what is your understanding of love, actually? <laughs> It'll play on words. Okay. Let's, oh yeah, the movie, right? <laughs> I went there with you. <laughs> exactly. So, um, love, let's start with that. Mm -hmm. To me, love is what the Chinese call qi what the Indians, uh, the Hindus call prana, what um, physicists, physicist, <laughs> there's that word again, what physicists call energy. And it is life itself. Um, the Christians have a tradition of, of saying God is love. And for me, yeah, well, and if, you know, mathematically, if that equation is correct, then also love is God. What is love? Love is God. Love is God. When I look into the eyes of somebody that I really feel close to, I feel the universe. I feel God. That's love. And of course, tantric sex, you're bringing that kind of love into sex, you know? And so then, yeah, sex is love too, but ideally, well, and then even if you're not doing tantric sex, usually that's the, the time that people are the most connected when they're having sex. And I hear from female clients all the time that, the only time he can say he loves me is just before he comes, right? Mm. <laughs> if that not comes over. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I want to go back to love is God, right? That's, it's God. And, and I suppose some people don't believe in God. And yet, even somebody like Dr. Stephen Greer that you had on last week, he grew up being an atheist. And yet because of all of his interactions on the conscious and subconscious level with alien beings, he seems to believe in the higher, higher power at the very least, whatever we call it. Wow. Yeah. So, so I love that. The power of life is love. Excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, that's, 
That's beautiful. I, I don't think I've ever heard it said like that. So when people are in a relationship, and I know you work with people on this, how do they, how do we keep the magic, the love, the excitement alive in a relationship? Is there some practices that can help us communicate with love and keep creating magic? Yeah. <laughs> and it's what my observation is that most of us lose, both in the relationships I have had and in clients' relationships. And that is after a while, we seem to start taking each other for granted. We stop appreciating at the beginning of a relationship. We're just profuse about, oh my God, you're so cool. I like this about you. I like that about you. Oh, you did that again, right? And we lose that. At some point, we start taking each other for granted. And what are we doing then? We're having expectations of, you're not making me happy anymore, right? And it, it, it happens because one person slows down the praise, slows down the appreciation, slows down the gratitude, and then the other person feels vulnerable and slows it down too without even thinking about it. And at some point, it's there's no longer any gratitude and appreciation. It's all about expectations of how come you're not making me happy today? How come you didn't kiss me that way this morning? Right. So that's what goes wrong. And the way to fix that is to do what you did at the beginning. And for me, in my observation, all those things that I adored about her, all those qualities that I'm no longer appreciating, she still has all those qualities, still has them. And if I appreciate those qualities, then that's going to make her feel good. And she's going to bring up more of that stuff. Yeah, because, oh, I like it when Walter says nice stuff when I do nice stuff. And so then that becomes a cycle in the other direction where we, it feeds off of each other. And because I'm being nice, you're being more nice. And, and, and it's all about gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Gratitude is the antidote to really pretty much everything. It's the antidote to uh, emotional pain, the antidote to fear. The, and it's the way to actually forgive, to be grateful. You know, like when, when I am grateful to my abusive adopted father for all the instruments and for the fact that, dude, I had a really cool music career. Thank you. <laughs> then I'm automatically forgiving him. Right. Then and, and at the very least, I'm not focusing on what a hamana hamana he was to me, but sh showing appreciation. Right. And then that's for me, it's the most effective way that I have been able to forgive um, them and other people in my world. And that is when they come into my awareness. And that is, you know, you have a thought of that guy. You say, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. And it just, it diffuses all of the fear, all of the hate, the hatred, right? Because I was angry and hated. And it diffuses all of the emotional pain of what happened to me, you know, just, and it's a, it's a gift, gift. You know, anytime you say thank you to somebody, it's a gift. Yeah. And as a psychic, is that something like now? Are you getting information? Are you receiving? Are you seeing things? Or is that something you shut off and turn on when you choose? It's always there, but you have to put it in the background. And then sometimes, yeah, you have to shut it off. You know, if I'm out in public and, and I'm in the presence of somebody that it has just really hateful antagonistic energy i can't can't be there i have to walk away leave and i for sure can't have a conversation with that person wow yeah oh so, yeah the information is always there and, and you learn how to take care of yourself and then that sometimes means not going to the mall because i just don't want to deal with all of that energy that is walking past me right now right yeah <laughs> Yeah, like the Hollywood Bowl. There's so many places like that where it's just <laughs> thousands of humans. And I've yeah. often wondered, how does somebody like yourself manage through a situation like that? Yeah, you shut that down. But then the cool part is I can feel the musicians. Mm, that's interesting. What do you mean? And the singers. I can feel their heart. Ooh. You know, what's well, like... Uh, Adam Apollo, that, that's his name, what he was talking about. Well, and then um, Dr. Stephen Greer too, that you go to this place of being aware of a different 
consciousness, being aware of different reality. And in that space, we're all there. We're all there. You know, if I'm tuning into the drummer and really feeling what he's feeling, first of all, I'm, I connect to the drummer because I know what he's doing to some extent, at least since I did it. But then I'm tuning into his soul, his spirit. And I know that he's making the singers look really good because he's just so into this. And if he wasn't, the band would suck. You're only as good as your drummer, right? There's some music tips here. <laughs> but that really helps me enjoy the music. And then I'll switch to the piano player who's doing something really cool. But besides what I'm hearing, I feel his soul, her soul, feel their heart. And as the empowerment psychic, which is what you're known as, um, when working with somebody and what they get out of it, can you share a success story? Somebody that you work with, a client you had or clients? I'd love to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have to give some thought here to how to, how to help him maintain um, an, anonymity. Oh, okay. Um, oh, but yes. it's, it's somebody who was essentially abused emotionally by his parents, was constantly downtrodden, uh, beat down and told that he was not worthy. And um, at the same time, was told that he had to overachieve, right? And he, he um, became the student body president of an Ivy League university with that drive. But in a social situation, he was a completely different person. He had very little, if any, self-confidence. And he has been in a horrifying marriage for six years where she was abusing him. And I've been working with him for about these six years, actually more than six years. And I have gotten him to the point where he realizes that my God, if I was able to accomplish being the student body president of an Ivy League university, I sure as hell don't have to deal with the abuse of this woman and I can take my power. And so he has taken his power with her. They're going through a divorce where he's, he's getting healed and getting whole, recovering because he was also supporting her. Mm -hmm. And um, he's getting along way better with his boss because he has taken his power and um, his boss is now intimidated by him because um, my client is so good and so intelligent and sees through the boss's mistakes. And he's, um, women in, in general are responding really openly to him, which never happened in his life. Because, you know, he didn't see himself as a magnet for women, didn't see himself as even attractive but had this sense of having to accomplish stuff and and he has accomplished amazing things makes big time money right but was being abused and and now he's he's at a point where he's just so grateful for the tools that i've given him the tools of loving himself the tool of what's in it for let's call him dave right what's in this for dave right which he never stopped to consider before. He was always worried about having people like him and pleasing them so that they didn't abuse him. Oh, wow. That's yeah, and that's also sadly pretty common among people to various degrees, right? And in, in Dave's case, it was pretty extreme. And he's, whew, he, he, he is, he's really fun to talk to now because so many exciting things are happening in his life. And Dave used to be depressing <laughs> to talk to. He's like, okay, we're going to get you through this, Dave. Right? Okay, man. Okay, man. Right? That was like six or seven years ago. Wow. And now yeah. his insides are matching his outsides. Yeah. And he's, he never even imagined that, that he could have happy experiences like what he's having. And when it comes to dreams, you know, it's fascinating because there's so much information out there about dreams. There's everything from it is your subconscious working, it, working things out. There's a thing about dreams that is, you know, maybe this is you stepping into another life of yours or a parallel universe. There's just 
all these suppositions. I'm curious, what's your understanding, Walter, of dreams and their purpose? I've had hundreds of dreams come true, which some people call deja vu. Um, and in my case, um, I, I, just, I was always interested in this kind of phenomena. And even before I uh, realized I was particularly psychic, I wrote down my dreams. I kept a pad um, by my nightstand. And the moment I woke up, whether it was the middle of the night or the morning, I wrote, wrote down what I dreamt, right? And through that process, I knew that, yeah, my God, hundreds of dreams are coming true. And sometimes it takes 10, 20 years. Sometimes it takes a week. So what I've noticed, though, is that in the dreams, most of the information was symbolic. And I thought that I was in a particular place because it looked like a place that I knew, but no, it was actually Frankfurt, Germany that looked like Seattle, right, for instance. And then I also noticed that in the dream, I would be really very scared about what was happening frequently or feeling a lot of anxiety about what was happening. But as the events actually started to, as I realized the dream was coming true, I realized that Oh, well, step by step, I got to this place and all of those experiences helped me realize that, well, this isn't so bad, right? So I believe that most of our dreams are precognitive. That's the word, I think, right? Uh, telling the future. Um, but then also, I have come to realize that sleeping and dreaming, sleeping is... Uh, not for the purposes of physical recovery, even though that's a byproduct. Sleeping is for the purposes of spiritual recovery, because we really are spiritual beings having a human experience, and the human experience is so incredibly difficult and takes so much energy that when we sleep and dream, it's us being in the spirit world rejuvenating getting our energy back and yeah in the morning you have more physical energy but that's because it was from the spirit world um scientists say that uh, our energy comes from our cells right biologically but okay so where the hell does that come from right where does the energy in your cells come from and physicists <laughs> say that <laughs> the, the reality is 99.9999 percent empty space Right, so even your cells are 99.999% empty space. So whatever energy is there is coming from the energy world, the spirit world. Love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a dream, uh, maybe even recently, that you've had or a vision that came true that you can share? Was it meeting me? <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. You can share. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, there, there was one, and, and and you know the fascinating things about thing about dreams is it's not necessarily the fulfillment of your dreams; it's information, mm -hmm. and um, it's information about what's going to happen. But it's not necessarily a good thing even though there may be good stuff about it. And, and so, yeah, I've, I've written down 40 some dreams that I had um, about this particular person who I met and um, got really close to and the relationship has ended, but um, I don't think it's over because I've had dreams that have not come true yet. But the dreams that did come true, she fulfilled you know it's like we recognized each other and she's also a psychic and she had that same experience of yeah i've had dreams about you and i recognize you wow yeah but then she ended the relationship and um you know for various reasons that stuff happens and uh then i'm in a place where i wonder uh, about the dreams that haven't come true yet. I wonder, is that maybe somebody else, right? Who feels like this one, right? So you never know. And the only way that you really do know is when it happens, mm. right? It's sort of like you can't 
plan on how you're going to feel at 2.31 p.m. tomorrow afternoon mm -hmm. until 2.31 becomes now. Yeah. And there's no point in even trying to plan that. There's a quote from Maya Angelou that reminds me of oh, you, yeah. Walter Zajac. Oh. <laughs> 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 and the quote is, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive. And to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. <laughs> I love that. I've seen that quote before, and it really touches my heart. Yeah. Yeah, it does, because from where you started to who you are today, I mean, it's a miracle. You know, not everybody makes that choice to Thank be you. able to arrive. Thank you, Debbie. Being that that means are. a lot. Thank you. Yeah. So, and yeah, I'm impressed. And um, <laughs> Thank you. So this is Dare to Dream, Walter. Yes, and we're talking about dreams. <laughs> we're talking about dreams. But what do you next dare to dream? Or what do you want to see in your future? Any goals or dreams you'd like to have come true? I get the most fulfillment from touching people's lives. When a client like Dave that I was talking about, pretty much every session he's telling me these days, oh my God, thank you. Thank you, you've changed my life. And that is more fulfilling than anything else. It's actually more fulfilling than playing drums in front of thousands of people. <laughs> um, so I want so much more of that, but I want to do that in a bigger way. And my goal is to have my novel turned into a movie or a miniseries. And I have friends here in the business who say, oh my God, this would make a great movie or miniseries. So that's my goal, uh, to help empower people through sharing what I went through and what I recovered from and, and the fact that, yeah, you can still have a hell of a lot of fun. I had it so much fun as a musician. I was on the TV. <laughs> I had a, a, so much fun and I've, I've had so many experiences in life that were just amazing and fulfilling as hell. And for me, the key to happiness is love in part, right? But more than that, actually fun, 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 fun. Figure out some way to make this moment fun, right? So I want to convey that in this movie or mini series. And that's what I tried to convey in the book is, dude, life is hard, but figure out a way to have fun with it. Say F it and just do it and figure out a way to make it nice. That's you can Right, it's perspective, and that's what most people teach these days: is perspective. Change your perspective, you change your world. So, for uh, folks, you know, I know you just tell me what you offer: readings, counseling, etc. I know they can go to psychicwalter.com. Share briefly what can people reach out to you for, and where can they find you? Okay, empowerment is my main thing, whether it's through NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, or uh, Psychic Medium Readings, or just tuning into Susan's boyfriend in Australia, um, or love advice, helping people through a relationship. All of it is about empowering yourself, you know, like with Dave. What's in this for Dave? And not to be self-centered, but to Put yourself first so that you have something to give. If you don't put yourself first, you don't really have even love to give. If you really don't love Dave or Walter or Debbie, then any love that you give is going to end up coming from a needy perspective. Can you, can you guys love me, please? Whereas what I encourage people to do is just give it as a gift. Give the love and have fun, have fun, have fun, have fun, have fun. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I've enjoyed this. Debbie, I had a great time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. You have great questions and, you, and you're a very sweet soul. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I end today's show with this quote from Nate Parker. Any psychologist will tell you that healing comes from honest communication, excuse me, comes from honest confrontation with <laughs> our injury or with our past. Whatever that thing is that has hurt us or traumatized us, until we face it head on, we will have issues moving forward. 
in a healthy way. Thanks for tuning in today. Remember, subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment. I love reading them. And if you're listening on podcasts and you want to see what we look like, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. Next week on the show, the guest featured will be Krista Marie Miller who is an intuitive voice channeler of Mary Magdalene. And she will be discussing the power of divine sexuality. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is a show I can promise (laughs) you don't want to watch and listen to. Thank you so much for joining me and Walter today. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality. Yeah.